so this session on the grossing techniques will be discussing the different specimens that we are that will come to you for grossing in the from the gi tract so the session on the grossing techniques will be highlighted under the following headings the first question that we are going to ask here is why i am doing this grossing then we are going to discuss what all resections are going to come to you for grossing and then finally that will come is the competence of the pathologist who is doing this grossing and that is how it should be performed so we'll be discussing this session under the following headlines so the first and the foremost question is why i'm doing this grossing so uh, the answer to this is i'm doing this grossing to judge the surgeon's job so i'm telling whether the surgeon has completely removed the tumor or he has left some part of the tumor inside the patient's body so these are being told as the completeness of resection and they are being given a numerical number of r0 r1 and r2 r0 resections are called when the tumor is removed completely and there is no involvement of any margin so none of the margins are positive in the r0 resection neither grossly nor microscopically so you do not find any evidence of tumor at any of the margins that is the r0 resection the next is the r1 resection where grossly you do not find any tumor mass at any of the margins however microscopically any of these margins could be positive so suppose one margin is positive microscopically then also you are going to call it as an r1 resection so any of the margin coming positive on microscopy is what is called as r1 resection and then finally in r2 resection the tumor will be present grossly as well as microscopically at the marginal site so these are the different types of resection that will be uh, that will be encountering during the grossing of the tissues so these are called r0 r1 and r2 resections so once we know what type of resection has been performed we are also going to typify the surgeon according to the type of resections they have done so these type of resections could have been done by a general surgeon where the yield of lymph node would differ as compared to that of an onco surgeon where the yield of lymph nodes is going to be higher so uh, it is not always in hard and fast rule but generally this is the dictum that is followed so you are going to type what kind of surgery they have done and then you are going to tell based on the surgery what type of surgeon he is then subsequently you are also going to tell the stage of the tumor which will finally determine if the patient would require any further therapies or not so post surgery what all therapies are to be given that is the role of the pathologist will come here and based on his, your report or based on what uh, report you are finding the patient is given therapy according to that now what staging system should i follow so there are different staging systems uh, which are being followed by the americans and the britishers the americans follow the college of american pathologists protocol and the britishers they follow the royal college of pathologists protocols which are also called the rcpat data sets so you can follow any of these because as indians we do not have any data sets of our own country so we can we have the advantage that it is up to our wish what we want to follow whether we want to follow the cap protocol or the rcpat data sets so for any tumor that you are going to go for grossing these data sets or cap protocols they are available free of cost online and you can always download them from the net and before you go for grossing you can take out a print out to know what all things are going to be important for your grossing so uh, based on these parameters you are going to stage the tumor in what is the stage and based on the stage patient will be offered further uh, therapies which could be chemo or radiotherapy then what are the resected margins and when we are going to call that the margins are positive or when we are going to call that they are negative so a margin that is less than 1 mm these are called these are supposedly involved margin when the margin is just near to the surface and it is less than 1 mm then we say that the margins are involved if it is 1 to 5 mm from the margin then we are going to say that the margin is closed but it is uninvolved but if the tumor is more than 5 mm away from the margin then we are going to say that the margins are clear and there is no involvement of the margin so this is the usual uh, terminologies that are being followed for any resection specimen now once we know that why we are doing this grossing the next question that will arise is what are we grossing so what all things that will come to our table for grossing from the gi tract so uh, from the gi tract we could get specimens from the esophagus which could be esophagectomy alone or esophagus combined with part of stomach then we could have uh, specimens from the stomach which could be different portions of the stomach it could be either a wedge of the stomach or complete stomach or just the distal portion of the stomach 
then from the small bowel we could have duodenal or uh, jejunal resections which are called segmental resections because you are only receiving uh, a segment of the bowel and then from the colon the commonest one that we receive is the right hemicolectomy specimen which is uh, being done for the tumors in the ileocecal junction and you could also get a total colectomy specimen from the colon and sometimes you can also get a subtotal colectomy specimen now the sigmoid colon and upper rectum they could be removed in lower anterior section and for the lower rectal tumors which are in the lower part of the rectum you would require an APR that is abdominal perineal resection so these are the different resections that you will be encountering during your grossing of the GI tract. So first moving on to the esophagus. Now this is an esophagus specimen and as we can see here this is the external surface of the esophagus. Now we know that the entire GIT esophagus is one portion which has no serosal lining on the entire external surface. So esophagus is devoid of any serosal lining and it is directly adherent to the surrounding, uh, surrounding tissue by the adventitial soft tissue. So if you are going to remove the esophagus from the uh, from the area so the resection would require complete dissection of the adventitial soft tissue which is attached to the external surface of the esophagus so this is the external adventitial soft tissue that is adherent to the esophagus and actually we do not have any serosal lining in the esophagus now this is important because if you are going to look for the for the classes of the for the staging of the tumor so there is no serosal lining that you will encounter in the t4 staging and it is directly the involvement of the adventitial soft tissue that is the fatty tissue which is present outside the muscularis so uh, now uh, then this is the cut surface of the esophagus and in this cut surface the esophageal mucosa we all know is a squamous epithelium which is not keratinized that is the normal esophageal mucosa and since it is a squamous epithelium so the epithelium is going to be whitish in color as is being seen here so this is an entire whitish esophageal mucosa which is the normal mucosa of the esophagus so cut surface of the esophagus is going to look like this now next question is the gastroesophageal junction which is very important when we are going to look for the tumors of the esophagus and since most of the tumors are confined to the lower part of the esophagus or in the mid esophagus an important question that will arise is whether uh, if they are involving the gastroesophageal junction so an important question that will arise is whether the tumor is of the esophagus or if the tumor is that of the gastroesophageal junction or if the tumor belongs to the upper cardia of the stomach or the gastric carcinoma so that is an important important question that we had to face when we are looking at the tumors which are involving the GEJ or the lower part of the esophagus. Now what is gastroesophageal junction? Gastroesophageal junction is the area where the esophageal mucosa is coming and abutting on the gastric mucosa. So we can identify the esophageal mucosa by the pearly white color because of the squamous lining and then wherein the, the mucosa is going to and rest on the brownish mucosa that is the area that we are going to call it the gastroesophageal junction but sometimes in Barrett's esophagus as we all know that there is an upward projection of the gastric mucosa into the esophageal lumen so sometimes this gastroesophageal junction will not be as well demarcated as in the normal esophagus so in cases of tumors there will be there will be disturbance of this gastroesophageal junction or rather you can say the squamocolumnar junction so how we how are we going to identify the gastroesophageal junction is we are going to look at this dip and we are going to count this this area as the gastroesophageal junction and if the tube even if this mucosa is brownish here so still we are going to count this region as the gastroesophageal junction for all purposes of classification of the tumor so like as I said this is involvement of the lower part of the esophagus by Barrett's mucosa and here we could see the upward tongues of the gastric mucosa which are going into the esophageal area and this is replaced the whitish esophageal mucosa is replaced now by the gastric type of the mucosa. So here the squamocolumnar junction is not well demarcated and we could not really tell on after opening the specimen that where the gastroesophageal junction lies. So what we are going to do is we are look, look, going to look at the depth where the yeah, where the esophageal mucosa is coming and sitting on the gastric mucosa so this area where there is a dip this is the area that we are going to count as gastroesophageal junction for all purposes of tumor classification uh, so like suppose if we have a tumor like this which is involving the lower esophageal uh, gastroesophageal junction so what we are going to do is we are going to measure the entire length of the tumor 
and in the entire length we are going to look at the midpoint of the tumor so suppose the midpoint of the tumor for this lies here so the midpoint is the central point of the tumor that we are going to mark then we are going to mark the gastroesophageal junction and we know that in this specimen this is the gj now once we know that this is the gj and this is the center point of the tumor we are going to measure the distance of the midpoint of the tumor from the gj and this distance if it is uh, now on the gastric side if this distance is less than 2 cm then we are going to count these tumors as the esophageal carcinomas but if uh, if the distance of the midpoint of the tumor is more than 2 cm from the gastroesophageal junction then we are going to count these tumors as the gastric carcinoma so that is the dictum that is followed for the gastroesophageal junction tumors and previously the length of the lesion was supposedly more but now 2 cm is the uh, is the thing that we are going to measure from the midpoint of the tumor now once we know that tumor is there the what all things that we do for the tnm classification that we look for the cap protocols and that is t classification that is the direct penetration of the tumor or the direct penetration of the primary tumor so that is called t t for tumor n for node and m for metastasis now in the tnm classification the first t stands for the direct progression of the tumor and uh, as we can see the tumor could be confined to the mucosa that is pt1a or it could just uh, be involving the lamina propria again pt1a and then in pt1b it has breached the submucosa in two it goes into the muscle layer so this is the muscularis in three it has crossed the muscularis and in four it has crossed the serosa so this is the direct extension of the tumor that is being universally followed throughout the gi tract so this we had discussed and uh, the distance is measured from the macroscopic gastroesophageal junction and not from the squamocolumnar junction for all purposes of classification of tumor of the esophagus or the cardia. So that is how we are going to classify this. Now the next is the gastric resection specimen. In the gastric resection specimens, we have different kind of resections that is we could have a wedge resection of the stomach, we could have a central removal of the stomach, proximal part, distal part could be removed, subtotal gastrectomy or total gastrectomy. So there are n number of permutation combinations that can be done in the gastric resections. So uh, this is from our own uh, case and this is the gastric tumor that we are seeing. So just to show you that uh, this is the gastric mucosa and these are all the gastric mucosal pores and if you have a gastric specimen we are going to identify first the lesser curvature and the greater cur greater curvature which are the easiest to identify the curvature that will be more that is the greater curvature and then once you open the specimen you are going to identify the rugal folds now if it is a total gastrectomy specimen uh, then in the total gastrectomy specimen you will be able to identify the pylorus at one end because the pylorus the number of rugal folds are going to be less and now in as in this specimen we could make out that there is a dimpled area here this is an ulcerated lesion and it is predominantly an endophytic lesion because we could not see an exophytic growth on the surface and this is the tumor which is seen well away from one margin but it is relatively close to the other margin so when you have a tumor which is close to one margin so what is the best thing that that you can do is take a longitudinal section of the tumor rather than the cross section so what we, sh we should do is we should take a section like this in which we are going to ink this area that is the margin and then we are going to see how much is the exact distance of the tumor from the margin and once you are going to look it into your microscope so there are two ways to do it either you can do a morphometric analysis on the system or you can uh, with the help of your marker you can mark the area where you are seeing the tumor at the end and the area and you can mark the margin and then you can measure the distance with the help of the normal ruler so that is also one way to measure the distance of the tumor from the margin and especially if the margin is closed then you would like to take the longitudinal section with the margin and for the other side since the tumor is away from the other side so we can just take one shaved margin you need not uh, submit the entire shave of the of the margin because then your cassettes are going to be more so you can just sense, uh, you can just submit any representative one section from the other margin that you are seeing there and these are the two margins that is the proximal one uh, one resected margin and other resected margin and apart from that you also have another margins in this which are your um, omental margins which are the your uh, which are your greater omental margin and the lesser omental margin so apart from the a tumor that is the proximal and resected we also have radial mesenteric margins which are the in the stomach which are two that is the gastric and the uh, lesser omentum 
so uh, that was about the gastric resection and uh, at times you could also find cases in which the gastric uh, resections are done for the early gastric carcinomas or maybe for the genetic predisposing uh, gastric carcinomas wherein you will not see any overt growth in the stomach so that is uh, like for this case this was an early gastric carcinoma but here we could still make out that there are some small raised lesions and these are the areas that we are going to sample uh, take samples from but at times the stomach could also look normal and in those cases in uh, in those cases again you are going to submit some representative samples and you need not submit the entire specimen for evaluation so these are the cases of early gastric carcinomas and the sections that you are going to take is proximal margin distal margin lesser omental margin and then the greater omental margin in which again you are going to take representative sections only and not the entire fanning of the mesentery now uh, sometimes the gastric resections are done for gastrointestinal stromal tumors and if they are done for gist so in the gist resections they are different from the carcinoma resections you will take the sections from the margin that is proximal distal and the omental margins as we have discussed but for the t staging of the gist generally they the, since they arise from the muscularis so you are really not very much worried about the penetration into the muscle or into the serosa and the t staging will depend upon the size of the lesion so whether the lesion is relatively larger that is more than 5 cm so size of the lesion matters more for gist as compared to the depth of infiltration so in this again the cap protocol is going to be little different and sometimes you do have lymphomas of the stomach so in cases of lymphomas again you are going to mention about the degree of uh, depth of invasion into the muscularis tissue and um, though margins you are going to submit but they are not as important in the lymphomas as compared to the carcinomas Uh, so this is the irregular mucosa that we were talking of in early gastric carcinomas and these are the areas that you are going to submit your sections from and as you can see here this is an irregular area so actually we are not aware how much is the extent of the tumor so what you can best do is you can take a lengthwise section of this gastric mucosa and then you can label your slide as 1 2 3 then measure in how many slides you are seeing the tumor measure the distance of the tumor on microscopically and that will define the extent of the tumor so uh, how many lymph nodes should i take out from the stomach so at least 15 lymph nodes should be taken out from the total gastrectomy specimen and you need to sum you need not submit the lesser omental and greater omental separately because in your cap protocol you will be finally counting the total number of lymph nodes so though for the submission purpose and just for your microscopic examination you can write that these are the lesser omental and these are the greater omental lymph nodes but uh, you have to count them in total when you are doing your cap protocol staging now uh, coming on to this small bowel and as we have already mentioned that small bowel adenocarcinomas are the rarest to be seen in cases of uh, in the entire git and the reason is because there is an easy washout and there is a carpet like appearance of the of the small intestinal mucosa so the carcinomas of the small bowel are the rarest to be seen in the entire gi tract and uh, the common thing that in that are encountered in the small bowel are the perforations like as we could see this is a perforation here and where and we have to tell what is the cause for the perforation so if you have perforations in the small bowel just tell the distance of the perforation from the nearest margin and if there are multiple perforations you can label them as first second or third perforation and measure the distance from the closest margin for each perforation so that is how you are going to sample these areas take multiple sections from the mesentery because ischemic uh, involvement is a common cause in the small bowel uh, resection thing and then you are if there is any ad additional pathology that also you are going to mention another thing in the small bowel apart from the carcinomas are the neuroendocrine tumors which are fairly common in the small bowel and in the neuroendocrine tumor though you are more interested in the key 67 index still you are going to tell the extent of the tumor that how far is the tumor infiltrating into the mucosa the margins are going to be similar as we have talked of in the stomach that is the proximal distal and the radial omental resected margin so uh, now the third type of resection that can be encountered from the small bowel are the involvement of the mesentery wherein it could be fibromatosis or inflammatory mix of uh, myofibroblastic tumors so in these tumors the what is important is the size of the uh, the largest size of the largest lesion and then you are going to take sections from the proximal and distal margin so this grading again is going to be different and it will be like that of the sarcoma grading 
now moving on to the most common specimen that is encountered for the from the gi tract and that is the colon and amongst the colon also the commonest one that is performed is the right hemicolectomy specimen so let's see what uh, what is the important areas that we should remember while we are doing the grossing of the colon so uh, the first is the we know that colon comprises of cecum ascending colon transverse descending sigmoid colon and the rectum now the cecum is completely peritoneal organ because it is covered by peritoneum on all sides when we look at the ascending and descending colon in both ascending and descending colon they are deficient of the peritoneum on the posterior aspect so the posterior aspect of ascending and descending colon they do not have any mesenteric attachment and these areas the surgeon needs to dissect these areas to cut the colon from the uh, from the abdomen so these are the areas where the peritoneal covering is deficient the transverse colon again is intraperitoneal completely covered by peritoneum sigmoid is again intraperitoneal whereas the rectum only in the upper uh, upper third in, uh, only the upper two third of the anterior part of the rectum is covered by the peritoneum whereas the posterior part is largely devoid of the peritoneal covering so let's see what we will get in the right hemicolectomy specimen so in the right hemicolectomy specimen we will get a part of the ileum we will get appendix we will get the ascending colon and part of transverse colon so these are the things that we will encounter in the right hemicolectomy specimen now as i said this ascending colon it is deficient in the peritoneum posteriorly and since the uh, posteriorly the peritoneum is deficient so that will constitute your circumferential resected margin or the radial margin in cases of ascending colon carcinomas so let's see what are the margins that we will see in the colectomy specimen so uh, now as you can make out this is the mesenteric attachment of the bowel and in if you cut the mesentery from here so this will constitute one of the mesenteric resected margin and in cases for the areas which are completely peritoneal this mesenteric resected margin is actually your radial margin for those specimens so suppose we are talking of the gastric resection the resected margin of the greater and lesser omentum will become your radial margin or the circumferential resected margin so actually the term circumferential resected margin is originally used for the rectal carcinomas because in the rectal carcinomas posterior part is large largely devoid of the peritoneal covering so the surgeon has to dissect the soft tissue in the posterior part of the rectum which is called mesorectum and he has to take out the rectum from that uh, soft tissue after the soft tissue dissection so the actual terminology of crm was originally used for the rectal carcinomas that is the apr specimens but then subsequently it was followed in the entire git which has created a lot of confusion so you should understand that crm is used only for the rectal resections and for the esophageal resections whereas for cases of gastric and colon carcinomas especially the carcinomas which are lying in the ileocecal junction now for those carcinomas we are basically talking of the mesenteric resected margin that will constitute your circumferential resected margin so the margins in the colectomy will be serosal that is the peritoneal surface involvement predict the subsequent intraperitoneal recurrence and circumferential resected margin are the non peritoneal involvement they indicate a higher uh, risk of recurrence so actually serosa serosal surface is not an actual margin but it will determine the t staging of the tumor so this is the serosal surface involvement that is very important when we'll talk of the pt 3 and pt4 discrimination so if the serosa is involved you will see it as pt4 if it is not involved you will see it as pt3 so it is not actually any margin because the surface is not dissected by the surgeon and it is the mesenteric margin cut end that is the circumferential resected margin in the ileocecal resection so let's see we have a tumor here Uh, so let's think we have a tumor here and for this tumor suppose it has reached up to the surface so we will say that the serosa is involved or suppose in in this area it has only gone up to the muscularis so we will say that the muscularis is involved so it is a pt2 tumor now uh, if they remove the mesentery from here so this will become the circumferential resected margin or the cut end of the mesenteric margin so this will be documented separately so there could be a possibility that the tumor is still in the muscle and you have 
have this margin as positive so that is a possibility like suppose for this segment suppose this is the mesentery cut margin so here this will become your circumferential resected margin if the tumor lies here and this is the this is the mesentery that is just adjacent to the tumor perpendicular tumor to the tumor so this will become your mesentery cut margin or the circumferential resected margin for this bowel segment and this area will count in your t staging that is the pt3 or pt4 staging whether the cirrhosis surface is involved or not so uh, uh, so this is again uh, like this is the bowel wall here we have the ileum and uh, this is the colon so uh, this we have already talked of that there is uh, the mesentric margin will become your this margin so what all things that we are going to look for in the colon resection specimen so this is a hemicolectomy specimen we have an ileum here we have a cecum here and how are we going to identify the cecum that the length and diameter of the cecum are almost similar so it is the largest distended part of the colon and then on the other side we have a narrowed lumen which will represent the ileal lumen so this is the ileal part and this is the cecal part and here we have the ascending colon so what we are going to do is generally the tumors are going to be within the ileocecal junction so most commonly they will be found here and then what we are going to do is we are going to ink this surface take a section from this surface which is now be constituting your circumferential resected margin so if the mesentery is close to the tumor you can take a sections directly with the tumor wherein you can also document your cirrhosal involvement but if the mesentery is far away from the tumor then you can ink that mesentery which is perpendicular to the tumor and take it as the circumferential resected margin you take another sections of the tumor through the bowel wall that is completely through the bowel wall and therein you are going also going to look for the depth of invasion and to the muscularis and deeper part so how you are going to open the specimen you can uh, generally the you should open the specimen along the anti mesentric border where you do not see your fat attachment so you open it longitudinally along the anti mesentric border from the upward and lower part and once you know that you can palpate that this is the tumor so there are two ways to open it so either you can open it longitudinally or you can open it in the cross section wise manner so you uh, i always feel that doing cross section wise is still better if you do it longitudinally but it is completely up to you how you want to look at this specimen so now these are the serial slices of the tumor and here we could make out that this is the whitish growth which is present in the muscle so what we are going to do is on these serial slices we are going to look in which slice the tumor is nearest to the margin so like for this case this uh, here in the tumor seems to have crossed the muscle layer and here it it, it appears as if it is going into the subserosal fat so this is the area where it appears to be closest to the margin so this is the area which i am going to ink and take sections from if there are any other slice in which you feel the tumor is the closest so that also you can take the other way to open the tumor is you can open them longitudinally take serial slices again look for the area where the tumor is closest to the margin so if the tumor is on the side if it is only on one side of the bowel wall then you can take the uh, you can take the sections with the adherent mesentery and you can uh, depict the depth of infiltration of the tumor so again another hemicolectomy specimen you can open it longitudinally or cross section wise as i said and uh, you can make out that this is the ileal mucosa this is the cecal segment and this is the colonic segment and we have got a tumor in the ileo cecal junction and it is always good to fix the specimen once you cut open it so that uh, there, there is a good preservation and you can get your slides in a better manner and sometimes the mesentery can completely cover the bowel wall wherein it becomes difficult to identify what is the actual mesentric cut margin so now what will happen is there are three margins that uh, there are three areas which we are interested in so we have talked of the proximal part we have talked of the distal part then what we are going to take is the circumferential resected margin and this circumferential resected margin is perpendicular to the tumor and it is the mesentric cut margin that we are talking of in the peritonealized organ now if the tumor lies in the ascending colon so if the tumor is not in the ileocecal region and if it lies in the ascending colon then in the ascending colon the posterior aspect of the ascending colon which is non peritonealized that will become your circumferential resected margin so uh, in the hemicolectomy specimen you can take random sections from the ascending colon posterior surface which you can mention separately in your report but the mesentric cut surface is going to be your circumferential resected margin for the 
ileocecal specimens so in completely peritoneal organ mesenteric resected margin is the only crm like from tumor at the ileocecal junction so i hope it's clear now so uh, this is relatively confusing because uh, we are talking of crms mainly in the rectal resections now uh, coming on to what all changes have come in the AGCC 8th edition so with the current ones that are being followed are the american joint committee classification 8th edition are the ones that are being followed so uh, there are uh, these are the changes that have come in the PT4A the changes have come in tumor deposits in lymphovascular introduction when are you going to call it as a lymph vessel or vessel invasion and then they say that molecular targets are to be done for all cases of colon carcinomas which are inclusive of MSI testing KRAS and RAS and B so uh, this is the these are the changes that have come up in the AJCC 8th edition so first coming on to PT4A what is PT4A PT4A we all know when it has crossed the uh, when it has crossed the muscle it has crossed the perimuscular connective tissue and now it is involving the serosa if the tumor is is very close to the serosa but not touching it so even if it is less than one millimeter so now here we have said that if it is less than one millimeter we can take those margins as positive for rest of the resections but here in the gastric lesions though it is an area of controversy and some people will say that this is pt4a but in most cases people are going to call it as a pt3 so if the tumor is not touching the serosa then it is better to call it as a pt3 rather than pt4a and if if it is infiltrating the serosa, reaching at the serosa, crossing the serosa or if the tumor is causing perforation of the serosa then, then you are going to call it as a PT4A. If only acellular mucin is present at the surface then also you are not going to call it as a PT4A and unless the neoplastic scenes, uh, cells are seen uh, adherent to the serosa uh, at the level of the serosa then also you are going to call it as a PT3 tumor. So uh, now what is a positive circumferential margin? So in the positive circumferential margin, even if the tumor cells are less than one millimeter from the margin, so then also you are going to say that the CRM is positive. If there is lymphovascular emboli at the CRM, say that it is positive. If there is a node, lymph node which is seen at the CRM which has tumor deposits, say that the CRM is more positive and then you can add in your comment that at the CRM we are calling it positive because there is a presence of a lymph node with metastatic tumor deposit so all these things will constitute constitute a positive circumferential resected margin is positive CRM included in the T staging so if you have a cut end of the mesenteric margin that is positive so are you going to include that in the T staging and you will say that this is PT4 no you are not going to call it as a PT4 to call it as a PT4 the tumor what you are talking of is basically tumor touching the serosal surface and you could have a tumor confined to muscularis and still your CRM could be positive so these are different things which should not be intermingled so uh, now another question which of these do you think is beyond muscularis propria so as you can see here now this is the tumor which is infiltrating into the muscle and this is the area which is which seems beyond the muscle and again here here in you have your muscle and these are the tumor deposits which seems outside the muscle so here it appears as if this blue yeah, this eosinophilic hue which is surrounding the tumor cells is actually the muscle fibers so how you are going to uh, how you are going to judge whether it is in the muscularis or outside muscularis is uh, on histology itself you can judge so you look for the presence of these fat globules adjacent to the neoplastic cells and if you have many fat globules adjacent to the neoplastic cells even if it appears as if this is the muscle layer so this indicates that the tumor has already gone beyond the muscularis propria so presence of fat infiltration around the uh, around the neoplastic cells indicate that the tumor is already out of the muscle and that is one soft clue that will tell you that it is actually a pt3 and not a PT2 tuber. Now, next important change that has come in the AGCC 8th edition are the tumor deposits. So, what are tumor deposits? These are discrete tumor nodules within the lymphoid drainage area of the primary carcinomas without identifiable lymph node, vascular, or neural structure. So, you may not see any definite vessel nerve or uh, sorry you may not see any definite lymphovascular invasion but these are actually the deposits of the tumor within the lymphatic drainage area of the primary tumor and if you have no lymph node positive and if there are only tumor deposits you will use 
the terminology as PN1C if there are no regional lymphodes. So suppose there are five tumor deposits and there is presence of one positive node. So in those cases, you will not uh, mention this PT1 uh, PN1C and you will just say that the tumor uh, that the lymph node is positive. You will call it as a PN1. The shape, size, and contour of the of the deposits are not important when we are talking of TDs, and the minimum there is no minimum size criteria and no definite shape of the lesion that has to be present to call them as TDs. So, what is required to call them as TDs? The mo the single most important criteria is that you should be able to identify that lesion as within the lymph node. So, you should see. Uh, you should not sorry you should not see any lymphatic tissue around that uh, tumor deposit so there should not be any subcapsular sinus good amount of lymphoid tissue or a definite rounded structure so all those things will take you away from calling it as a td they could be located anywhere they could be in the subserosa they could be in the mesentery non peritonealized pericolic perirectal or mesorectal tissue so that as i said there have been a lot of change in the tds over the past few ajcc's classification in the fifth edition they were talking of the size that if the size is more than 3 mm we will call it as a lymph node even if no lymphoid structures are seen in the sixth edition they say that even if no lymphoid structures are seen but the shape is round we will call it as a lymph node and in the seventh edition they said that tds uh, there is no residual lymph node is found then we are going to call it as a tds uh, so now are tumor deposits measured in gastric carcinomas no so for when we are discussing gastric carcinomas there is no mention of tds and whatever deposits you are going to find in the mesentery you are going to count them as the lymph nodes uh, so they are only talked of when we are talking of the uh, when we are talking of the colon carcinomas so uh, let's discuss about a important differential area pt3 and pt4a so if the tumor cells are touching the serosal surface as it is seen here so then you are going to call it as a pt4a if the tumor cells are here and they are touching the serosal surface now herein you could find that the tumor cells are present but they are relatively very close to the serosal surface but not yet touching it so though this is uh, this area it is touching so this is pt4 but for this cluster like that we are seeing here suppose there is no area which is like this and we are in doubt whether to call this area as pt3 or pt4 so if you are after taking multiple levels even if you find the tumor which is close to the serosal surface but not touching it then again we are going to call it as a pt3 only and not pt4a so uh, now about the TDs and lymph node deposits. So as I said, size is not the criteria. So this is uh, an area which is less than three millimeter. But in this area, you could uh, you could find an identifiable lymphoid structure. So this will constitute as a lymph node deposits and not a TD. So even if uh, the size is less, then also we could say that this is a lymph nodal deposit. So whether it is a TD or a lymph node, so here you have some sprinkling of the lymphocytes. There are presence of thick walled blood vessels and then there are tumor deposits. Deposits. So this will usually be counted as a TD and not as a lymph node. Why? Because we do not see any lymph node capsule or there is no subcapsular lymphoid sinus and generally in the lymph node we do not see thick walled blood vessels. So all these things will take you away from a lymph node deposits and you will count this as a TD. Now again another area which is showing you a deposit within uh, these structure and there are surrounding these lymphoid cells and you do see some subcapsular sinus so this we are going to count as a lymph node even if the size is the small. Now for this, is this a TD or a lymph node? Again, here we could identify that there are presence of nerve fibers. There are multiple deposits, though the lymphoid structures and uh, lymphoid cells are present, but this will be counted as a TD because we are seeing the area adjacent to the nerve fibers and adjacent to the blood vessels. So if you have nearby neural tissue, so these we are going to call it as a perineural invasion and this we are not going to call it as a, as a tumor deposits, but the sep uh, sorry, this we are not going to call it as a lymph node deposits. Now moving on to the last area that is the rectal tumors and this is the area wherein we will be talking a lot and lot about the circumferential resected margin. So we look at the pictographical representation of the rectal tumor anteriorly there is a dipping down of the peritoneum but posteriorly the peritoneum forms a V and the posterior surface is largely devoid of any peritoneal covering. So there is no serosal covering on the posterior aspect and it is sitting directly on the, on the, uh, on the tailbone that is being seen here. So uh, that is about the rectal tumors. And what is mesorectal excision? So since we know that rectal tumors are here and we have got a component of the fat that is being present next to these uh, rectal areas. So this, this is the 
thing that is going to be dissected along with the rectal excision. So this is the rectum, herein we have got a tumor and this is a soft tissue which is present on the posterior aspect of the rectum. So what the surgeon is going to do is, he is going to dissect the soft tissue. So in the APRs or the, rect or the lower anterior sections, this is the area where he is going to cut and then he is going to dissect the soft tissue along the bone. So this is the complete mesorectal envelope that is going to accompany the rectal, uh, rectal specimens. So type of resections in the rectum, we could have a high anterior resection or a low anterior resection. High anterior resections means you want to spare the low part of the rectum and the anal and the anal sphincters. In the low anterior resection, if the tumor is relatively low, still you want to save the anal sphincters. But in the abdominoperineal resection, that is APR, you are going to completely remove the anal sphincters and the rectum and part of the sigmoid colon. So these are the different kind of resections which are done for the presence of different tumors within the rectum. Uh, for the different locations of the rectal tumor. So uh, now this is a rectal uh, lesion and this is a beautiful slide which is shown the posterior surface and the anterior surface. Anteriorly this area is shiny. So, shiny area means you have got your peritoneal covering on that surface. So this entire area is shiny. It is the anterior surface and this entire thing is the serosal margin peritonealized a serosal surface or the peritoneal covered surface. Now as we go down here in the anterior surface we, this area is devoid of any peritoneum and this is actually the circumferential resected margin where the surgeon had to dissect the fat or to remove the rectum from its attachment. Similarly on the posterior aspect when we see there is only this portion which has got a shiny envelope. So this is the only peritoneal covered surface and the large part on the posterior surface is devoid of any peritoneal covering. So this is the area which is entirely devoid of peritoneum. So if a tumor is lying here anteriorly you will have a serosal surface whereas posteriorly you will have the circumferential resected margin so if the tumor is lying at a you know that if you are going to cut through the tumor the posterior surface or the inked margin is going to be a posterior circumferential resected margin now a bit a word of about the APRs. Now uh, this we had discussed that anteriorly the peritoneal reflection goes down and posteriorly peritoneal reflections is up and this is the complete mesorectal envelope that we are going to see. If you have this good bulk of the mesorectum or the soft tissue surrounding the lower part of the rectum then you know that the resection is complete. So this is the posterior surface ink black and anterior surface is inked green and how do you ink the specimen? You can use any poster colors uh, for inking the specimen and those poster colors you can just keep it for one minute and then wipe it with a cotton and the poster colors are going to get embedded within the tissue so anterior surface with a different color posterior with a different color that will help you to tell uh, the relation of the tumor with the different surfaces of the rectum so uh, now again this is the anterior surface of the rectum and herein we could see the peritoneal reflection going down and in the lower part we have no peritoneal uh, covering. So this area we could see that there is a dip. Actually this is the area where the muscle is attached and this is called, uh, this is a normal dip and it is not actually any defect in the mesorectum. So this is the normal dip that is uh, sometimes they will do a levator sparing surgery. They don't want to take out the muscle so that is why we could see a dip over here. So uh, now when we are getting the rectal specimens, it is our duty to tell whether the mesorectal envelope is complete, whether the surgeon has done his job completely and he has completely removed the mesorectal envelope. That is a good surgeon is going to take make his dissection around the bone and this entire greenish soft tissue is going to come with the rectum. Whereas if the surgeon is inexperienced, so he can make a hazy cut here and then instead of going along the posterior part of the mesorectum, he could cut here and then the mesorectal envelope is going to be incomplete or hazy so we are it is our duty as a pathologist to tell whether the mesorectal envelope is complete or it is not complete so uh, there are three things that are to be followed in the cap protocol also to tell the completeness of the mesorectum so complete plane of mesorectal resection and uh, there are no defects which are more than five millimeters so there is no defects which are seen in the mesorectal envelope almost complete when you have deeper than five millimeter defects but actually you are not seeing the muscularis but if the if there is any area where the surgeon has actually during dissection has entered into the rectum and suppose if the surgeon is not experienced and instead of dissecting along the mesorectal envelope he has made a cut here so here the muscularis could have been visible so these are called incomplete mesorectal envelope wherein the muscularis uh, mucosa muscularis propria becomes visible so this are to be done 
done on gross inspection and when you are going to grossly look at the specimen that is the time when you are going to make your decision whether the mesorectal envelope is complete or not so for this good bulk of mesorectum this seems to be a complete mesorectal envelope on the posterior aspect as well as on the anterior aspect uh, so that was about the mesorectal envelope and these are the again complete envelopes here in the mesorectal envelope seems complete and in this area since this is the portion where the muscularis propria is visible so it is actually an incomplete mesorectal envelope and incomplete resection has been done so uh, these two even if there are some small defects in the lower part that are acceptable unless the muscularis propria is visible so uh, these are the important things that are to be remembered when we are dealing with the rectal specimens now other thing that is encountered is post chemotherapy specimens wherein the tumor is not very much evident or if in, uh, this is a diffusely infiltrating specimen or in the post chemo specimens now in the post chemo specimens what is our duty as a pathologist we need to tell whether the how much is the response to the chemotherapy that the patient has received so if we are getting a post therapy specimen it is our duty to tell if there is no viable tumor cell that means the tumor has completely responded and uh, there is a complete remove uh, complete disappearance of the tumor after the therapy so no viable cancer cells it is called T uh, trs that is tumor regression score zero and if single or very small groups are present it is one and if there are more than single or group of cells then it is two and if there is extensive tumor that is more than 50 percent of the area showing you viable tumor then you are going to call it as a yeah, that is TRS grade 3 so there are different systems which are proposed for grading that uh, for assessing the response to uh, response of tumor regression and this is the modified rian score is being followed relatively easy subjectivity inter observer variability is also not too much and this is the one that is usually followed for all chemo related specimens so post rian scale, modified rian scale, staging scheme is the one that is followed for the uh, for the post chemo or post therapy specimens and herein you have to tell about the completeness of the therapy so these are the different grades that are being visible so in the one you don't see any viable tumor so this is a complete response a very good response and in the two you could occasionally see this is scattered single gland so this is a partial response again a partial response uh, this in which you could still find few of these glands and this is an incomplete response where uh, there is actually large amount of tumor and there is not much response to the therapy and now the important question here is if you have a specimen like this if, if there is no viable tumor cell so how much area is to be sampled so initially at the first go if you do not see any obvious tumor so from the area of scarring you are going to take a minimum of five sections so from the area where you see that there is some fibrous tissue laying down take some five six sections from there and if after examining microscopically you do not find any tumor then you need to submit the entire area where the mucosa is is abnormal or the mucosa is showing you fibrous thickening to say that the tumor has completely responded so uh, now another important contentious area are the tumor buds and what are tumor buds these are actually small drops of the tumor cells into the deeper areas of the tumor penetration and if the cell cluster is less than five cells then that is what we call as the tumor buds and this is an independent prognostic factor it is not counted in the tnm staging but you need to mention it separately in your report that what is the number of the tumor buds whether the score is low or high so, uh, so if it is uh, depending upon the number of tumor buds that you are seeing per uh, area field that is going to determine the uh, prognostically the importance of the uh, prognostic importance for the patient. So uh, now coming on to the concluding this session if bowel is adherent to adjacent bowel or infiltrating it so will you you upgrade the taste t stage suppose there is a loop of the bowel which is adherent to the other other segment adjacent segment so are you going to upgrade the t stage so to upgrade the t stage you need to see a direct tumor infiltration so if the bowel is only adherent and there is no direct involvement or there is no breaching of the serosa till that stage you are going to count them as a lower t stage and unless they have breached the serosa layer and entered into the adjacent structures then you are going to say that it is pt4 tumor deposits in the mesentery could uh, could count only in absence of lymph node metastasis so if you have no lymph node then you will say that pt n1c and if you have any positive lymph node you just mention in your reports the number of tds so if there are 12 20 tds just mention them as i said for the tumor buds they are also an independent prognostic factor for 
periphery. If the lymph nodes are positive, any stage given by them, tumor deposits in the mesentery is not M1. So if you have scattered tumor deposits in the mesentery or if the CRM is coming positive, that is actually not M1. And why it is not M1? Because it is within the drainage area of the primary tumor. So these are not counted as the metastasis unless the surgeon has sent you separately in a container saying that these are distant peritoneal deposits, then you are going to count it as a M1. And minimum number of lymph nodes that you should take out from a colon is 12 and the best area to get sampled is from the apical lymph nodes. So most of the cases the surgeon is going to put a tie at the top of the lesion and those are called apical lymph nodes and the yield of the lymph nodes is going to be maximum from the apical tie. So at the at in most of the times you will end up finding 12 lymph nodes only at the apical tie itself. So uh, now coming on to the end of this session and the take home message. So first is what you are adding to the surgery done. So why I am doing the grossing is I want to add something to what the surgeon has already performed. So I want to tell about the completeness of surgery. I want to tell about the margin status. I want to tell whether the patient would require chemo or uh, further any therapy. The depth of tumor invasion that I wanted to tell and the pathological staging to guide further therapy as I said. And finally, the features that would indicate that the patient could undergo a distant metastasis. So suppose your tumor is only a PT2 tumor and you have only a lymphovascular emboli. So that is again an independent prognostic factor and based on a case to case basis, the oncosurgeon can decide whether this patient is going to receive chemo or not. So these are independent factors that are going to determine the therapy of the patient. So uh, thank you so much. We end this session here and I hope this is relatively clearer though it is little complex subject that I have taken up today and uh, then maybe we can discuss some of the questions in the next session live session. Thank you so much.